Welcome. I am so looking forward to this topic because this is someone I've spoken with before. He is such a generous man. Um, what we're going to be talking today is about how culture will supercharge your accounting firm. And today I have with me Randy Crabtree, who you might already know. But some of the talking points we're going to touch on is the core pillars of a high-performing accounting firm culture and what that means. The next thing we're going to look at is creating a healthy, sustainable culture, which is possible for you to scale for growth. And then we're going to wrap up with attract qualified accountants who are passionate about the profession. So those things are some of the talking points. There's going to be so much more. And because of that, I suggest you have pen and paper ready because Randy loves to share. And we'll be able to let you know where you can connect with him and find out more as we wrap up. But just to give you a heads up, Randy is co-founder and partner of TriMerit Specialty Tax Professionals. And TriMerit has been named by Inc. Magazine as one of the 5,000 fastest growing privately held companies in the U.S. over the last two years. Pretty impressive. And he's also co-host of the Unique CPA podcast, the Bridging the Gap Conference, and was recently named on the top 100 most influential people in accounting by Accounting Today. So if you want to find more details about Randy and Crab, try, uh, Randy Crabtree and Try Merit Specialty Tax, go to try-merit.com and you can get everything there. So Randy, let's just jump in because I know that there's so much. How did you get to be so passionate about culture and really the well-being of not only the firm owners, but the people working in the firm as well? Yeah, it's that. Well, first, thank you for the intro. I need to add you to my PR team. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, culture, actually, culture came out of a culture has always been important to me. Um, let's jump into that real quick because when I, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life and, you know, 16 years old, I started my first firm and I always thought it was important to, you know, enjoy what you were doing. Fast forward, you know, 10 years and I was uh, working at my second accounting firm and ended up working for an individual that was kind of a micromanager slash tyrant type and I realized that that was not something I was ever going to do because my goal was to to start my own accounting firm. And so I was I was taking notes on things I enjoyed, things I didn't enjoy. The first firm I worked with, I enjoyed tremendously. They were great partners, great atmosphere. We all went out to lunch together multiple times a week. We, we even got together outside of work. But I had got to this point where I was two years in, it was time for a change, which was a mistake on my end, but it was time for a change. I got to go get more experience. And this culture was awful. And, and, you know, make a long story short, after four months, I left that firm without a job. I walked out, said, I'm not coming back. Um, called the, uh, the old firm I was at just to tell them what I did. And the, they immediately said, Hey, you want to come back here? And I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And so that was that that culture that they had created just solidified the fact that this is the type of thing I want to do. So culture has always been extremely important to me. Absolutely. Uh, actually, earlier this week, I was talking with my son. And what we were focusing on is the difference between management and leadership. And that is, I think, part of a key also, because as far as employees go, nobody wants to be managed but they want to be really uh, encouraged to grow and be the best that they can be. So let's talk about really the uh, get on the same page as far as culture. How would you define culture so that we're all coming from the same place? That's a that's a that's a great question as well. You are awesome at this, by the way. <laughs> that's another great question. Um, so because you can, when you think culture, I automatically think good culture, but that isn't defined culture. Culture is, you know, whatever culture you have at your firm and you can intentionally create a bad culture or, or a culture of burnout. I mean, you can intentionally do that knowing you're going to have high turnover, knowing you're probably going to have to pay these people more because they know they're going to work 80 hours a week and they, and you know, they're, you're going to burn them out and you know, they're going to turn over every two years, but you know that you're going to somehow get significant revenue out of that. That's not the culture I want. That's not the culture that I think is sustainable 
although there's probably some firms out there that have sustained that that type of culture. When I think of culture, I define culture as obviously the good firm culture, but it's really, really hard to define. I've tried to define, like, let's come up with a sentence of what what is a good culture. And going back and forth, actually with ChatGPT about a year ago, um, uh, I came up with a one sentence, or chat, and I came up with one sentence mm -hmm. that I think at least in my mind defines, you know, what creates a good culture. And it's very simple. And I love this. Maybe not everybody will, but uh, I have it on this other screen. Make sure I say it correctly. Weak cultures rely on rules while strong cultures rely on relationships. And that's kind of what you were saying there as well before. And to expand on that, as accountants, we are used to rules. We are we are governed by rules all over the place. And we have historically been based on rules. And it's so easy for us to fall in the trap of, well, let's set rules and we'll follow the rules rather than let's build relationships. And when I'm talking relationships, it's more so with the people you work with. I mean, your clients are important too, but to me, those relationships internally are what, you know, creating a positive internal relationship with the people you work with creates a good corporate culture. Okay. So as you were talking about, I was thinking, oh, the micromanaging is what I would call burn and churn. Yeah. So, so that's something to think about. And then uh, if you really look at the relationships, it, it's about realizing that if you invest in the people and you let them know that you care, they, they're going to give back and they're going to be loyal. Plus, I think it's harder to replace a really good staff member than it is a client. That That's my feelings, especially oh. with the way that it is right now with hiring and staffing going on. I'm 100% with you on that. In fact, there's the, one of the best things you can do for a culture is that there is a bad client is immediately, you know, cut the cord because yep. your staff will be so excited. They'll feel so supported. They'll feel like they're important because you chose them over this revenue stream and the revenue stream can be replaced. The people are harder to replace. A absolutely. Uh, I, I definitely coach my clients on that all the time is to come up after during tax season, keep your hit list of who you want to get rid of. And then, um, you know, talk about it with your staff and let's kick someone off the island if they just are not a right fit. So, okay, that's one of the things about benefits is really letting your employees know that they have a voice and that they matter. So any other benefits that you see about really having this positive culture in a firm? Oh, I mean, I mean, everything. Culture is the base in my mind for everything. So if you, I mean, here, a simple one, and we just talked about it a little bit, retaining employees. I mean, mm -hmm. the cost of, you know, I'm no expert, but what's the, what's the cost to replace in one person? I hear anywhere from 50% of their salary to 200% of your salary. So if you create an atmosphere where people feel valued and feel appreciated and feel like they can be themselves, I mean, that alone is a positive impact on the bottom line of a business and, you know, overall the top line, because well, I'll just give you an example at Trimerit, you know, we, his, we've been in business 17 years now, actually, we've got about six more weeks before the seven, 17 year anniversary. I honestly, I should know this number, but I think in, in, and we're about 80 people now in 17 years, I think we've had, about six people voluntarily leave. I mean, they made the decision. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. we've made decisions that some people, you know, weren't perfect fits, but people deciding to go elsewhere. I mean, that's uh, I, to me, that's an unbelievable stat. And the 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 these cost savings of that, if you want to work accountants, mm -hmm. we'll look at it from a cost savings standpoint, is tremendous. And that alone allows you to do so many more things if you're not retraining people all the time, if you're not searching for new people all the time. Um, and so from that standpoint, it's it's great. And then, sorry, I'm going to ramble for a second. Mm -hmm. From another standpoint, when you create this culture where people feel valued, feel they can be open, 
you just find areas that you didn't even realize you should be going to. If people can, I feel like they can come to leadership and, and we, we have leadership obviously, but we all, I look at everybody as equals. Um, but if, if people feel they can go to leadership and with their ideas, I mean, that, we we've had uh, we had a uh, one of our new services that started three or four years ago that has been significant part of our growth. That a new employee came to us, me specifically, and said, "Hey, we should bring this internal." And I was like, "Yeah, I just want to outsource it. I just don't think we have the enough people in place to uh, to run this." And he was adamant about the fact that we should bring this internal. And I said, if you want to do it, you run with the program. And this new employee, even I've known him for years, mm -hmm. but he came to work with us uh, sometime in 2020, decided that, yes, he wanted to run with this new service. And it's been a huge success for us. So, so that's a huge benefit. People feel open to share their ideas, not follow these preconceived rules that are right. set in place. And, and, and it's evidence that you can lead from any position. Every single position matters. So that's part of why, you know, you, there's some really things, important things that you shared. Um, and, and one of the things that I think was really important and I want to really highlight it is people want to feel like they've been heard and seen. They, they crave that. And so you're able to invest in your staff in ways that go beyond monetary. I mean, you need to pay, pay them enough for them to you know, live well, but there's other ways to be able to give them benefits and invest in them also so that they actually stick around. So can you share some maybe steps on how to start moving this direction of having this positive work culture? Well, one is just, you have to be intentional. It has to be a, a, a something you significantly spend time on doing. Now it becomes second nature, um, but what, what some things that we do that I think help create a culture, and I feel like I'm bragging, but the fact we don't lose people, I think supports mm -hmm. the fact that we have a good culture. Some things that, that we do is, is again, that openness, allow everybody to share, but starting even at the beginning to create a culture, this, so when we hire a new person, and I don't get involved in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. I did, I used to, I don't anymore, but I get an automatic notification when somebody gets hired uh, from our payroll service. Then my assistant sets up a phone call, a Teams call with that new employee. Now, I don't let them know why. That's They actually may wonder who's Randy anyways and why am I got a Teams call set up with Randy? Who is this guy? Um, but uh, uh, we'll set up a Teams call and I just want to get to know them. I just, I just get on a call and I don't talk about work at all. I don't talk about, you know, what their role is and, and, you know, what they're planning on doing here. And, and, and that I just want to meet them as an individual outside of work. And just, I think when you do something like that, you've started that intentionality. You've started the fact that, Hey, you know, I'm important and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I feel important. I feel valued at this business. And so I do that with every new employee. In fact, I think I have one right now that just started that I need to get on the schedule. So I'll make sure that that's happening. But up and above that, even without that. So we do that. And I think I think my partner who, I, who started the firm with me, I think he's doing that now as well. Um, I was doing it uh, alone for a while. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he's doing it. So So get to know at least the two of us that started the firm. But another thing we do to show people that they're important is on calls. So we have teams calls for group meetings. We're virtual office. We're remote. Mm -hmm. That's important too, because people get so freaked out about how do I create a culture in a remote environment? That's a whole other live uh, session. We'll do we another do. session later. <laughs> exactly. <Down two. laughs> exactly. But what we do is, during a Teams call, let's say it's business development call, at the end of that call, once a month, one of the members on that call gets to just spend 10, 15 minutes sharing about themselves, sharing their outside of work passions, sharing who they are, sharing about their family, their pets, their travel, their, you know, this last one, uh, somebody shared all about fly fishing because he's a huge fly fisherman. So we all learned about mm -hmm. fly fishing, but that's his passion. And so we get to hear that. 
I've got I've got to learn that you know our head of marketing is this unbelievable artist and has like pieces in galleries. I've learned that one of our partners was a professional motocross racer before he came work with us. Um, that uh, someone else plays the fiddle in a band. I mean, all these cool things you learn about people. That is actually important to work too, but it's more important to them and the value of their life. And so that's just, and I can go on for this for a while. And I know we don't have unlimited time, but those are some things we do. Okay. Part of what I'm hearing to get started is first, you have to make that decision and commit to it. Be yep. very intentional. You want to make sure that you knowing the people who are working beyond what they're doing in the office, whether it's virtual or in person, to let them know that they matter. Um, also that there's this open door policy where anybody with a good idea can go ahead and voice their opinions and not be shut down. But the other part that I'm really hearing is that there is so much diversity in your firm and that there are studies about not just cultural diversity or gender diversity, but bringing in people with different interests, different strengths, actually benefits a firm as opposed to firms where everybody looks like everybody else. Oh, that you just said another hot topic for me. Um, if, if everybody in the firm was a clone of me, we would go nowhere. I mean, we would not, we would not, we wouldn't be on the top 5,000 fastest growing firms. We wouldn't even be a firm. I don't think because, <laughs> because, you know, I have certain skills, mm -hmm. but, but those skills, you know, are not going to get everything done. Let me tell you a, a cool story that, uh, that we did. We do in person. I mentioned shortly ago that we're remote twice a year we get together as an entire organization in person, which, you know, with close to 80 people now is not cheap, but the fact that we don't have turnover, it's well worth it. Cause we can, we got more than enough cushion to pay for these. And so, <laughs> excuse me, at a year ago, November's uh, get together, we did this um, uh, Clifton strengths finders, where we all kind of learned about ourselves yeah. and what our strengths are and doesn't identify weaknesses. Everything you have is a strength. It's just, but what are your strongest strengths? And so we did that. Then in the May get together, we kind of went deeper into that. And the final outcome of that discussion was, all right, at the end of this, learning about ourselves and our strengths and how we use those strengths, let's break it to four corners of this big room we were in and Let's have and the four strengths, and I'm probably getting them a little bit wrong, but the four strengths were the uh, the get stuff done group, <laughs> the mm -hmm. doers, the strategic thinkers, the relationship builders, and the influencers. And so when we broke out into the four corners of those of that room and looked around, it was like we I can't get anything done without them. And and the group I was in is obviously important to everybody else, but it just highlighted the fact that, that as you said, the diversity, mm -hmm. uh, all different aspects of the diversity is so important for a successful firm, successful firm. I guess that's the way to say it, for a thriving uh, environment for people to be successful is so important. And that was such, had such an impact on me. And I think everybody just seeing all these different people that we need and can't, can't mm -hmm. succeed without them. We, we, we definitely need to avoid hiring people that are just like us. Um, if anything, you want to hire people that are the opposite of you. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that I see over and over and over again, um, and I'm sure that you see this too, is burnout in the profession. And that, I believe that when there's negativity, it's energy draining because just like that second job that you had, you, you hate just going to it, mm -hmm. um, let alone being there feeling like uh, that could be a prison sentence until you're released to go home at night. So how does a positive culture maybe counteract or reduce burnout from ha happening, even though everybody's still working hard? Yeah, it's... To me, that's one of the biggest things I think that's helped us is having that that positive culture that I believe contributes to a lack of burnout. I'm one of the things when I look at the the benefits of avoiding burnout is the leadership kind of styles. You talked about leadership before. To me, personally, I often don't. I mean, 
I guess people say, Randy, you're a leader or whatever. I don't look at that. I don't lead by like, mm -hmm. you know, directing people or anything. I think I lead by example. And I think my example helps avoid burnout from the standpoint. I feel if I am a leader, I lead with vulnerability and empathy. I, I, I am open. I will share anything with anybody, whether it's positive, we can celebrate the positives or if it's negative, which, you know, you probably know this and a lot of people do, but I, I do a lot of discussion on, on burnout and mental health awareness. And a lot of that is personal experience. And I've had some pretty significant, you know, personal experiences, negative experiences that contributed to, you know, some bad mental health um, and burnout in the past. And I'm completely open to talk about any of that talk about you know you know I, i'll actually call myself a mental illness survivor from the standpoint that i was going through depression and this kind of stuff and that openness to be able to share i think shows people that it's it's okay to not be perfect you can make mistakes it's okay to share if you're dealing with something and and that to me helps create a great culture, but to, it also is a culture where people feel like they don't have to hide mm -hmm. who they really are and what's really going on. And if I got a minute, let me just, let me tell a story here. I love telling stories. Please go for it. Um, so I do this mental health presentation for the account. I do it for other professions now as well, but for the accounting profession, I went out a year ago, January and did it for a, a firm in, I won't say where, but a, a fairly large firm. They asked me to come out pre-tax season just to kind of get people in a good mindset going into tax season about, you know, taking breaks and making sure they're not over, you know, doing it. Um, so I told the story. I told my story, which, you know, can get emotional for me and audience at times. At the end of the presentation, the Manji partner, just to set the stage here, big guy, you know, tall, um, and he gets up and starts being vulnerable, telling the story of his family dealing with depression. And as he's telling that story, you know, he's crying, I'm crying, the audience is crying, but you could just look out there and see the openness that everybody felt, the open door policy that mm -hmm. if he's willing to share all this and what he's gone through, I don't have to hide if I'm dealing with something. And and I could just see that that was it. I don't know if it was a change or they always had that, but that was such a big impact, I thought, to the people that were there working in that firm. And just to kind of complete the story of why I think vulnerability is so important, my vulnerability when I talk about this all goes back to a stroke I had 10 years ago and the mental issues I dealt with for five years after my stroke. That's part of the story when I'm telling this. Six months after I did this presentation for this firm, this Manji partner sent me an email and said, Randy, I just want to thank you for coming out that day and for being vulnerable, for sharing your story. And I just felt that I really needed to listen to you that day. And I just want to tell you two weeks ago, I had a stroke. And everything you've told me, everything you went through, I can see myself going through those those paths. And, and I have to remember that here's how you dealt with this and here's how you are open about it. And it's helped me so much just in this last two weeks. So that's vulnerability. Doing that internally, externally, I think just creates a culture. There's my story. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what I really hear, though, is that by you being open and showing not just your firm, but really showing other firms that they can do that also is you, you're probably saving lives in some way or saving marriages um, be, because of that. And, and it goes so much beyond just the messaging that you're giving, but the impact that it has because you're allowing people to see the whole part of you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it's given them insights or awareness that they might not have had otherwise. So, so I just want to really acknowledge what you're doing for the profession and how you're raising the bar in that way, because it's so important and it's very rarely talked about. Oh, thanks. It's something I'm yeah. passionate about for sure. Yeah, uh, it, it comes through. And, 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 and so I do also want to go to the other side, because even if you're moving in this direction, if it's something that you're navigating for the first time, of course, there's going to be 
places where you miss the mark or you make mistakes. Um, so anything about the negative impact about culture that we need to be aware of as someone might be moving in this direction? Yeah, so so there are things that will, in my mind, create a negative culture. And, and I, everybody can have their own opinion. Um, but for me, some of the things are, going back to what I said originally, micromanaging. I mean, that you just can't do it. You have to let people have their own ideas and, and, and flexibility and get there. I love the, the uh, study that's been out there by Jennifer Wilson, her team, the anytime, anywhere work survey, give people freedom to do that. So I think that's one, do that, give flexibility, give freedom. Don't micromanage. To me, one of the, one of the biggest impacts on creating a negative culture, and I'm guessing you'll probably agree with me is selling hours. Um, oh my gosh, that was definitely top of my mind. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Uh, the more and more and more I look at it, it is just there's no positive for you, the people you work with, the client. There's nothing in the selling an hour that is is putting is going to contribute to a positive culture. In my, it can contribute to that burnout culture mm -hmm. we talked about at the beginning but not a positive culture. So I think those are, and, and I know you you can expand on this probably for hours, um, but you know, the way I say it is let's, 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 and I mean, I, this isn't me making this up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I heard it elsewhere. Let's, uh, let's sell outcomes. Let's sell, you know, uh, uh, you know, relationships. Let's sell, um, you know, the, the bottom line value of what we're bringing to somebody. Let's not sell ours because what incentive is there for me as an employee to think outside the box, to go faster, to get a better outcome if the outcome is, hey, I make more if I work more. So I'm going to start working 80 hours a week now. Now I'm going to burn myself out and I'm probably going to have to you know, write off some of those hours too. But I look good because look, everybody sees me sitting at my desk for 80 hours a week now. And obviously I'm a star. And no, that's not the way to look at this. I, I remember that that was the culture a couple of years ago in New York City and other large corporate areas where uh, the trend was to eat at your desk. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh -huh. In, instead of going out. So I'd like to just go a little bit more into this because um, a big opponent against uh, selling hours, I, I think that it's unfair to you as well as your staff and your clients. But for so many firms, they're still traditional. They're stuck in it because they don't realize that there's an alternative or how to make the shift. So what do you see as a better solution if it's not going to be an hourly rate that someone is earning or about selling hours? Yeah, so for me personally, I could talk about it from a tax standpoint because mm -hmm. that's what I am. I'm sure. not an I'm not auditor. I've done audits. In fact, that when I was micromanaged, that was an audit I was working on. Um, but that I quickly got out of audit and stuck to tax. But from a tax standpoint, I think it's pretty easy to show value. I think val I think I think based billing based on value is is so easy and outcomes is so easy and so value can be tax savings but it doesn't necessarily have to be tax savings it can be you know hey we kept you in compliance when you were out of compliance and we just avoided penalties and interest you know and there's a value to that too mm -hmm. there's just a value to peace of mind for people that they know that they have the right solutions there's value to the fact that you're available to answer their questions and so troy merritt has always been based on value. And it's easy for us from a standpoint because what we do is tax credits and incentives. So I always know the value of what I, I what we, I don't bring anything to anybody because I don't do the work. Mm -hmm. What we as a firm uh, bring to them. And and so value billing to me is is my solution, our solution. And I think, you know, from a profitability standpoint, we've done pretty well. So I think I can prove that value billing works mm -hmm. with without, you know, I know people question, well, how do you know realization? How do you know? I, you know what? The bottom it has line, nothing to do with the cost analysis. <laughs> exactly. It is like, hey, is the bottom line good? You know mm -hmm. where you make a little more, you make a little less. You just intuitively know that. But 
you know, if it's a good client and you're comfortable with that work, you keep doing that work. If you need, if you know you're spending more time, you know, it, not to think about this time, but if you know this one just took a lot longer this year and, and we need to talk about the value of that going forward, fine, do it. You know it. You don't have to have every single 80 people in our firm tracking every single minute that they're working because mm -hmm. the, 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 just that alone is costing you money. That alone is wasting time. That right. alone, and from a negative standpoint, nobody wants to track time. You right there, you're creating a culture of negativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so just out of curiosity, then, would are your client, are your employees, um, are they pay an hourly rate or are they all on salary? And and this is just a curiosity, is because you're talking so much about value. Yeah, everybody's us, uh, and again. I was managing partner for the first 10 years. The last seven years, I more, what am I? The evangelist for a company out talking about everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't even get involved in that at all. But from my, the way I look at it, and boy, that's another thing. Yeah. Find your passion and stay with it. But mm -hmm. from my standpoint, um, I'm pretty sure everybody's, our, I mean, everybody's salary based. Mm -hmm. But we have reward systems in place too. Hey, yep. we're doing better. Everybody's doing better. It's that's a negative impact too. If if you put everything in place and that creates a growth and a bottom line growth and a top line growth, but all that does is support the partners, what's the incentive? Why right. do people want to do that? So have incentives in place for everybody that mm -hmm. you know, has if we do well, everybody do as well. And that's what we do. Sweet. So you mentioned about growth. Um, it's something that I think is so important because growth is different things to different people. And any um, thing that you want to share about how culture can impact the growth of a firm? Yeah. So, well, obviously the lack of turnover right there, right? There, and growth can be top line. It can be bottom line. The, mm -hmm. lack, the lack of turnover yeah. that the culture creates increases bottom line growth. That alone, that's easy enough. When people talk growth, it doesn't necessarily have to be, hey, we have to we have to double in revenue. You can double in revenue and make less money. Um, and so it, more so for me, I look at let's 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 figure out ways. More lack of turnover is one. I think growth is with a good culture, growth is supported by you know passion. You know, and so if, if you allow people in a good culture to follow their passion within the office, within work, you know. If they're if they realize that like that story I told where that individual brought in this new service, that was a passion of his. And so allowing him to follow that passion was important. We have an individual, she came in as my assistant oh, a couple of years ago now. And and I was working a lot with the marketing team. And she really realized quickly, she really liked that marketing aspect. Well, within months, she just converted to that marketing team. She's following her passion. She's going to be a lot more happy and excited with what she's doing and, and contribute more by allowing her to follow that. So that's going to contribute to growth. And it has. She's been a huge impact on this conference that we've put together, mm -hmm. uh, Bridging the Gap. And never would have known that if we didn't have this atmosphere where she can follow her passion. So, so that's important. I think if you're looking to grow as an accounting firm, niche, uh, I don't know what your thoughts, but to me, becoming a niche expert in something, you know, I was a generalist for years. Mm -hmm. And probably wasn't I was helpful but not probably as helpful as I could be to all those clients because I couldn't service all those industries when we started Trimerit one I found this passion of niching and specialty tax and it's just I love I don't work at all because I love everything I do mm -hmm. and so I think if you can find a niche that you enjoy whether it's a service and industry that's going to contribute to a, a culture. And if people also enjoy that, obviously that's going to contribute to culture, but that's going to contribute to growth. And I think from that standpoint, the people that we have really enjoy bringing value to our clients is what we do. Right. And they see that. And from that standpoint, it's much easier to do that when you can be an expert in a niche. And so I think niche is important as well. Okay. And, and I'm a firm believer in finding your niche. Um, or specialty. So your firm actually has a specialty because it's about the tax credits. Yep. Uh, and that those uh just for me to expand it, I'll 
similar, but they're not the same. So a niche is who you serve. The specialty is what you do for your people. Um, and that you can do either, or sometimes you can do both, Mm -hmm. but it's about once you became aware of what your specialty was, how it differentiated your firms from others, it allowed you to actually lead with value uh, because it was easier to communicate it. It had probably started attracting a different type of employee to your firm as well because they had to really get the specialty that you offer. And the other part of it is it it started attracting a certain type of client also, as opposed to the ones that just wanted cheap t- taxes filed. Exactly. And you can, you can define, I mean, it was when we defined the niche that we wanted to do, and it took us about six months to get Mm -hmm. Trimerit organized to a point where, how were we going to do everything? When we define that niche, we were able to define how we were going to go to business too. Right. And, And for us that going to business, it was a pretty easy decision, but it was, we're going to go to the tax advisor and then educate them and education's huge, Mm -hmm. uh, educate them. And then from there, you know, they're going to look to us to help support them with specialty tax and their clients. So mm-hmm. it's a one to many as well. So there was many aspects of niching that were so important. And and, and one more thing, I'm going to get a little tangential and then we'll yeah. start to wrap up, yep. is part of your growth strategy, I'm going to take a guess, is that you started removing yourself from the day-to-day operation. So in the beginning, you were doing more of the day-to-day and that you were able to start replacing yourself with some of that to allow you to be the face of Tri-Merit. Um, and, and how was that process for you, Randy? So that was that was the seven years ago I talked about where I I, I gave up the managing partner role. And it was it was intentional but also not as intentional as I probably should have been at that time mm-hmm. a lot of it was the the you know that's three years post stroke for me I was still struggling mentally and it was time like okay I'm not equipped right now to manage this firm I just it, I don't uh, you know the stress of managing this growing firm and I I saw the skyrocket it coming um, was not where I was equipped but I did in that transition realize you know what? I am not the KPI process procedure mm-hmm. managing overall firm. I'm really good at I'm really good at starting a firm. I'm really good at getting a firm growing. And I've started five or six different businesses over time. Um, Trimere, it's about the longest run I've had, I think, 17 years now. Um, but I can do that. But I thought. I had to take it to the next step and the next step and the next step. And it took me a while to realize, even after the transition, that no, I was, that's not my role. And that's why I'm so passionate about people finding their passion within the business, because I've done it now. I've been able to do it. And so that transition, while I fought it a little bit mentally, because, hey, I'm managing partner. If I'm not managing partner, what am I? What defines me? That was wrong thinking completely. And so if you are started a firm, if you're a managing partner firm, if you're a partner in a firm and you feel you have to follow this path because that's what they predefined for you, man, our growth has probably been impacted gigantically with Andy, my partner, taking on over managing partner and, you know, uh, with me going into this role where I can go out and educate the profession on, on anything. And, and, and so that while I didn't see it when the transition was happening, I knew it had to happen. That was a huge impact on our business and I think our culture. And I would, I would advise everybody to look at themselves and what their skills are and what their passions mm-hmm. are and try to find where those two intersect. Cause I've, I live in that intersection now Yep, and it is a beautiful place. I absolutely agree with you. You, if you're going to take all the risks of being a business owner, you ought to have a business that raises your quality of life instead of one that sucks the life out of you. Correct. So anyway, Randy, I know that we can go on and on. Um, always enjoy our conversations together. Some of the things that we touched on are the core pillars of a high-performing accounting firm culture, having that healthy, sustainable culture and how it is able to help you grow your firm, and also being able to attract qualified people who are passionate 
about what they're doing. So Randy, thank you so much. If somebody wants to reach out to you, they want to talk more with you about the topics that you geek out over, which is firm culture, mental health, and all things good about accounting. What's the best way for them to do that? So you mentioned at the beginning of our website, you know, try-merit.com. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, there's a meet the team page. You can look me up there. Uh, our marketing team is really good. So I'm usually all over LinkedIn too. So LinkedIn's a good spot to either reach out to me there or connect on LinkedIn as well. And I know that if somebody wanted to meet you in person, they can go to Bridging the Gap. So can you just share a little bit about um, who Bridging the Gap is for? So, yeah, so Bridging the Gaps, a conference will, our second annual uh, will be July uh, 22nd through 24th, uh, just outside uh, Chicago, uh, Rosemont, Illinois, which is O'Hare Airport. It's a conference, it is for uh, individuals within the accounting profession that are creating change, want to see change, feel like they need a change. And it's all about how we do better as a profession, how we can, uh, um, it's not a technical, there's a little tax talk this year, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of technical tax or accounting. It's more practice management, mental health, corporate culture, that type of aspects and how we can, you know, work less, make more, have a better work-life balance and, rise up this profession so we attract more individuals into it and i just want to say for anybody that is seeking something like that out it is well worth going it is going to be a quality event uh, so randy once again thank you so much i so appreciate you taking the time to join us and talk about these important topics and this is lauren fogelman with business success solutions showing accounting for owners how to double their income working half the time